Um, now I would like to um, introduce Marianne Ashford, uh, who is Principal Scientist at the Drug Targeting Medicines Evaluation Pharmaceutical Development at AstraZeneca in the UK, talking about nanomedicines and industry perspective. Good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to come here. I'm going to give you probably a slightly different um, industry perspective, um, but, but uh, concur with, with many of the things that my, my colleague has said. So what, I, what I'm trying to do this afternoon is, is perhaps share the therapeutic index challenge within, in the industry and perhaps how nanomedicines might address some of that looking a little bit, at the, not really looking at the design of nanomedicines, but perhaps how we might cho choose a target or, or, or um, for, to, to work with with the nanomedicine approach, share with you some predictive modelling we've done, and then try and share some, uh, highlight some of the work that we're trying to address translation into the clinic, which, it, as several people said during this conference, um, it, it has been an issue with, with the translation of nanomedicines, and then summarise by saying perhaps where, where the impact could be, be on, on a portfolio. So in terms of attrition rates within the industry, um, unfortunately, we're not a particularly successful industry. The, the graph on the, the left shows you over three time periods that, that, that you know, 90, 92% uh, failure rate. And here are the different phases of the failure rate. So a lot of what we do never makes it, 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 it to market. And over time, this, it's not the newest of data, but over, over, over time, we're not really proved with that. But if we perhaps look into some of the reasons for, for, for drug failures, it's a little bit down to pharmacokinetics here, but the majority, almost 70%, uh, are either due to lack of efficacy in, in man or adverse events in man, so issues with the therapeutic index. So if we consider um, nanomedicines uh, and, and if we look within the literature and some of the advantage of, of nanomedicines, you know, nanomedicine should be able to address some of these, these um, challenges and reason, reasons for the attrition that we have. So we know that nanomedicines can change drug characteristics and, and work with PK and, and solubility, and, and perhaps, you know, Abraxane with, 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 uh, has been discussed to the conference around it addresses the um, solubility of some molecules. Um, but, but as well as the, the PK and solubility changes, it, um, we can improve with, with targeting, and this is just tumour targeting in terms of oncology, and that's either by the EPR effect or looking at or different active targeting approaches, which are, are, are probably broader than oncology. All, you know, nanomeds can also be used to, to reduce toxicity, um, and that's particularly reducing... Um, see maxillary and toxicity and change in the distribution. So, you know, within the literature, there are lots of examples about how nanomedicines can ad address some of these issues. So we carried out a review back in 2011 now of the, the um, IV targeting technologies within oncology, and we had, came to a number of high-level conclusions, really that the EPR is a main targeting approach that had been used, um, that had been a lot done sort of preclinically in, in early clinical trials, but generally, it was limited efficacy improvement that was see, seen, but tolerability had been improved. But if 70% of the drugs fail due to efficacy safety balance, perhaps that change in biodistribution bio should be enough. We don't necessarily need the magic bu uh, bullet, but we do need to shift the balance that, that we've got. And I think we feel that the, felt that the combination with novel technology and novel, novel targets should improve efficacy. Most of, of the work that's been done in the literature and early clinical trials have, have been done by academics or smaller drug delivery companies, and they've been working with the existing molecules. But if we can get some of the novel targets and the novel technology and learn from previous failures, that may help the translation of nanomedicines. There have been little success with actively targeted particles in the clinic, but understanding has grown. I think we're running about nine now in clinical trials. There are a number of different delivery platforms that have been used, many with encouraging data. And just to try and cope with a number of platforms, we try to break them down into the, the um, liposomal approaches, polymeric um, nanoparticles, polymer conjugates, polymeric micelles, and inorganic particles. So a mixture of encapsulation techniques and conjugation techniques. And, and you know, there are several that probably fall into a number of those categories. There's been little design of API chemistry for, for nanoparticle delivery and, and issues with poor translation into the clinic, and I'll come back to that point. 
So, so what we try to do is try and think, of, think about sort of what was the progress versus what, what we, what, what's needed in targeted delivery. And I guess in, in, in a very high level, we, we need to move from, you know, um, we need to ensure we get prolonged clearance and, and modified distribution, localization at the disease site, some sort of control release at the disease site is, is, is particularly beneficial if that release is controlled, intercellular uptake and intercellular trafficking. And I think there's a number of control mechanisms, and I guess that was our view whether these things were doable, not necessarily together for, from the technologies. And then I think it's really very much about what we're applying it to. For a small molecule, we probably only need one, two, and three, because chemists are very good, or, or medicinal chemists can make molecules most of the time that cross into cells quite, quite happily. So as long as we can get to, to the, the target site of the target tissue, that the molecule could, um, should be able to get into cellularly, unless we're trying to get over resistance or, or, child mo or we've got charged molecules. But if we're looking for nucleic acids or, or perhaps more complex um, systems that address some of the intractable targets, we do need all, all five of these. So really just focusing perhaps on, on the EPR effect and, and um, small molecules. Um, I think there are a number of rules, and I wasn't going to go into it here in terms of how you might design something nicely put together by um, um, Bill Zamboni, and I know Scott McNeil showed this earlier in the week, in terms of surface charge, size, um, and solubility for, for getting into the right region for, for the EPR effect for a delivery system. But from our approach, well, if we, we've, we're choosing one of those technologies, how do we choose our target? And how do we choose what molecule or, or, or target area to work with? And I think for, from an industrial point of view, it's important to think how strong is the evidence that modulation of that target will produce clinical efficacy? I think we carry more risk with another medicine approach. You know, we've heard about the manufacturing challenges. There's probably a lot, lot more front-loading um, uh, in terms of, of, of pharmaceutical costs. So we want to make sure that we're not carrying, a, 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 we're carrying less risk in terms of the, of the target. If we actually have knowledge of the clinical schedule that gives us efficacy, we can actually help and design something that, that, that we want. I think we will ask ourselves if there are some, the safety limitations um, are related to on-target or off-target effects. If they're off-target effects, maybe we can use a chemical approach, but if they're on-target, we do need some sort of selective delivery. Is the toxicity CMAX or AUC driven? I think as we've seen, we, we can flatten our CMAX pro profiles, and I'll c come back to that. Does prolonged engagement with the target lead to greater efficacy? Because if not, we may not, not, we may not want the retention effect of the EPR effect. What is a clinical line of sight? And are we working with a tumor type that, that is particularly susceptible to, to the EPR effect? And again, I will come back to that. Have we got, are there preclinical models that are available to assess an improved therapeutic um, therapeutic index, I think we need those because we need to be able to convince versus a portfolio of other compounds that by using this new novel approach, we are going to actually improve our therapeutic impact index and therefore we know that the preclinical models that we're using to assess both efficacy and toxicity are liable to translate into the clinic. Have we got flexibility for any technology or do we need to, are we working with a stage where we only want an encapsulation rather than a conjugation technology if we're going for a conjugation um, technology, have we got chemical uh, groups that are away from our, our SAR that we can use for, for conjugating? And then we, we, we've heard about drug loading being a bit, bit of an issue and I think it, with many of these nanomedicines and are we liable to get enough drug to, to the target? And just practical things like we will probably prefer to lyophile our, uh, lyophilize our end product. So if you've only got 5% drug loading, that's 50, that's 50 milligrams in one, gra one gram, which is probably the maximal dose, of, but maximum vo volume that we'd like to lyophilize, and therefore what is the number of vials we'll end up giving to the patient. So I think we've got to think about all those things when, when choosing a target. Um, what we managed to do when we, we, we did, we started three feasibilities with, with, with um, three, three three companies, um, um, very different technologies, encapsulation and, and two conjugation technologies, and certainly the one with Bind Therapeutics is the most further, further forward, and, and we've got some nice both preclinical data where we've improved both safety and tolerability. Um, but I wasn't going to go into that in any more detail now. I just wanted to go in a little bit more about how we might apply these to, to future projects. So what we've tried to do is have a bit of a, with a predicting model, look at a model for nano 
uh, medicine. So there's a basic PK model here, and we've added on to this. I don't want to go through this in the interest of time, so I see I'm running out rapidly. But we, we, we've got our models to look at this, and I think each arrow represents a, a differential equation on this. On this, and what we're trying to do is work out what is the extravasion factor I into the tumour, and if we if we model that, what are we doing to the systemic PK and, and the tumour PK? So, if I just take a simple conventional IV formulation for it from a, 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 a typical compound in our portfolio, and we model both the the plasma P PK and the tumour PK, and we're assuming that the plasma PK is really important in terms of minimising the, the the tox effects, and then we model onto that what we're doing in terms of a, a, a nanomedicine approach. So we're assuming that this nanomedicine has a circulation half time of, of 48 hours, and we know that many of them have prolonged circulation times, and the release rate is, is 12 hours. And then if we move on for a release rate of 24 hours, we can see that, that in terms of what we've done to our plasma PK, we've actually halved that plasma PK, and if we understand how that plasma PK links with our toxicology, we, we can start designing in the sort of release rate that we want. But in the tumour, the, the, uh, the release rates are similar, it just takes a longer time to get to get there in terms of that tumour PK. So we can start trying to, before we do a lot of expensive feasibility studies, we can start to say, if we modulate the target in asking these questions, do we think a nanomedicine approach would be suitable for this sort of target? And does this prolonged engagement in the, in the tumour actually lead to actually added efficacy? Because if it doesn't, there is no point in actually uh, applying the approach. But the big question that we've got is, what is this KX? What it, how... Which tumour types will be most permeable and amenable to a nanomedicine approach? And I think just, just very quickly, I think what we've tried to do is, is some work taken from, from the literature, the antibody literature, and some in, internal data where we've tried to rank order a number of, of tumour types in terms of what we think those that are liable to be more permeable. Um, and therefore, we can say that, that um, in terms of permeability, does it make sense in terms of, of using a nanomedicine for this particular target, because many of our targets have got very strong disease linkage now, particularly with personalised medicine. So it's really important to make sure we've got the right drug with the right technology for the, for the right patient. And just to, so, so some work to try and get um, understand all this being carried out by one of our, our postdocs who's taken a lot of clinical uh, tumour samples and stained them for, for stroma, vascular, lymphatics and macrophages and just try to show you here with a number of, of tumour types just showing the, the stroma tumour, how different they are. And so, you know, a number of people have, have related to this earlier. And what we're trying to do is, is take the preclinical models and, and choose for a particular um, patient sample the preclinical model phenotype that both best um, mirrors the patient sample and therefore we can do the development and the efficacy studies in that model with, with our nanomedicine. So I've noticed that I'm out, 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 out of time, but just, just very quickly and just to summarise, in terms of where can nanomedicine have a potential impact on our portfolio, we, suddenly, we can look at life cycle management opportunities, we can look at uh, failed clinical uh, uh, candidates, particularly where, this is where we've looked at where we've had an issue in terms of therapeutic index uh, approaches and being able to put things back into um, the portfolio with an nanomedicine approach. Working early on, and perhaps with more of the conjugation technologies with leads, where we can design in drugs for um, some of the nanomedicine approaches, and knowing and you, you've got to read with a target that you know you're going to have, have an issue, and some of the earlier targets, and perhaps intractable targets, where we're going to need a nanomedicine approach to, to try and address so, them if we're using some of the more, more um, novel um, new modalities, such as messenger RNA or sRNA. So, so in summary, I think it's, you know, from an industry perspective, it, it's not just plugging in an nanomedicine approach. It's very much we need to understand our molecule. We need to understand the target, the tech, uh, toxicity. And if we can do modelling, I think that can aid selection and, and probably save us a, lo a lot of time and improve our knowledge. Further understanding of the, of the disease is, is key for avoiding that, that translations. Um, and I'm sure, you know, nanomedicines will be used for delivery of new modalities. We're increasingly using combination th therapy and running into tolerability issues. Um, and I think, you know, that they have got a real role in, in, in addressing some of that. So thanks very much.